Aha, too kind. Um, if you have a Bible with you, could you be finding Acts chapter 18? I'm going to read the first half of that chapter. Uh, resuming a series that we were in some time ago. Not sure precisely um, how much we'll go through over the next few weeks and months, but I would expect us at least to get up to Paul's farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. But for now, Acts chapter 18, verse 1, says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who'd recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worship of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the news of Corinth, uh, the, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I'll not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. I think it's in 2 Timothy that Paul is able to write uh, near the end of his life, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And uh, I don't know about you, if you're uh, already a follower of Jesus, uh, personally I would like to be able to say those words if I could foresee that my time were about to come to its conclusion. I would like to be able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have, I've run that race which God had for me. I didn't swerve from it. I didn't give up. I kept going and I hit the finishing line. Um, and then I would like to hear God say, oh, when I get to be with him in, uh, in heaven, in the new heavens and new earth, I would like to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, and that kind of just confronts me here as we look at yet another episode in, in Paul's life. We could just think, if you can cast your minds back to other times that we've looked at Letter of Acts, he has tended to go from place to place, first going to the synagogue to speak to Jews about Jesus being the Messiah. Then invariably there'd be some kind of conflict or, or opposition, as well as positive response that might involve him going somewhere else and sharing the message, not just with Jews, but with Greeks uh, as well. Effectively then planting a church, and maybe only in a matter of weeks, uh, 
leaving that place and going somewhere else. And so we could just think, well, we're just same old, same old, rinse and repeat, here we are again, it's another town, it's a different place. As we'll see in a moment when we consider some of the events that happened in Corinth, it is a bit distinct this time. Um, and we, we could then ask ourselves the question, how was it that Paul kept fighting the good fight, kept running the race that God marked out for him, and kept the faith? We just heard just then with the, uh, with the baptism, that word about, about perseverance. And God calls every believer in Jesus to persevere, to, to run well, to persevere in the purposes of God. And to do that, and there can be seasons in life when we might just think it's the same old, same old. We're just going through the same kind of pattern, if you like. So then how then do we stay fresh in God? And what does God provide to help us keep going in his purposes? I've spent a bit of time uh, with some other church leaders this week. It, for me, it's like an annual therapy session at the start of each year. Uh, a group of about 24, 25, maybe up to 30 uh, different guys who lead churches that all belong to the same kind of big global family of churches called New Frontiers. And, and that means just getting to spend some time in amongst the other uh, friends with a guy called Terry Virgo. That, might, that, main, that name might not mean much to everyone in the room, um, but to many of you, you know instantly who I mean. A guy who has kind of, if you like, fathered, and is now like a grandfatherly figure, he's fathered uh, a, a global movement of hundreds and hundreds of churches. And uh, he's been with us here um, some years ago, uh, some years ago now, actually, He's one of many um, church leaders across the nation that have just been in touch with us recently, making specific contact and saying, we're praying for you, and we're praying for the Marriott's, we're praying for what's going on, and uh, actually Terry uh, offered to come and be with us this year, so uh, another date for your diary will be the weekend of the, the 10th, 11th, 12th of May. I don't know precisely what we'll do then, um, but we will uh, receive uh, Terry and Wendy, and that will just be, um, no doubt, a wonderfully encouraging time. Why? Because he's an 84-year-old who's kept himself fresh in the purposes of God and has persevered. And just to spend a bit of time with him, you get, again, that sense of just his, uh, his fresh faith and enthusiasm for the purposes of God through the church. Still like a childlike eagerness to see what God will do in his church and a, and a faith, not just, oh, I suppose I've got to keep going, but God's about great purposes now, so I'm going to keep going. Um, and just an inspiration to, um, to spend time with. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And Paul was that kind of guy. I think Terry Virgo is that kind of guy. Caleb in the Old Testament uh, into his 80s and just pursuing God for all his might. So how does that work out here uh, at this time in Corinth? And then you know, by extension, how does it work out for us? Well, as we see Paul come to another new place, um, and he's kind of following a strategy, he's making some deliberate choices, he does tend to go to uh, big cities and significant cities in the Roman Empire, which in itself was quite a confrontational thing to do. You could get on really well in the Roman Empire as long as you were prepared to say that Caesar is Lord. And if you would kind of like bow down at the right moment and say those words, then you could do well in life. And so Paul is deliberately going to these major centers of the Roman Empire and saying, in effect, Caesar's not Lord. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me, prove, let me persuade you of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the savior of the whole world. Let me persuade you that he is Lord over everything and your best life will be 
take, uh, as Adam has done, will be taking your life and laying it down before Jesus and saying, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. And Paul is going from place to place to set up and encourage new communities of people to follow Jesus. So, so how, does, how does Paul, as it were, run well in the purposes of God? How does he stay fresh in God? What you see, first of all, when he arrives in Corinth, is that he finds fresh fellowship, which might be a surprise. We, we learn a little bit about Aquila and Priscilla. You might hear more about them next time. Uh, and he gets to know this new couple. Uh, same background in that they're uh, Jewish. Same faith in, I think, Aquila and Priscilla have already come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Rome before being uh, kicked out. Same occupation, even, uh, as tent makers or leather workers. So they've got loads in common, and they have time to kind of develop a relationship. In other words, Paul doesn't keep himself fresh and persevere in the purposes of God by being a loner, by just staying private with his faith, disconnected from others. It's amazing to hear. I think God does get hold of people through TikTok and just hearing others of uh, young men or young women just thinking, well, I've been reading, I've got no experience of church really, but for the past few months I've been reading the Bible. That's just happening lots. I, th I think as a church, just over a year ago, we, we prayed. We'd had a we had a particular day when we decided as a church, let's, let's fast and pray. We're going to go without food for the day and we're going to make more time uh, to seek God together. I don't know if you remember that. And we asked, we considered what it says in Ephesians about God being able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And it's just fascinating to see then in our own, since then, this kind of thing has happened a bit more. Just people finding Christ and coming in and uh, that's God answering prayer. I've been wondering actually that I think the time is right for us to spend some time in prayer and fasting some more and see well, what's next. What else does God want to do? Let's, let's seek more. Uh, you see in this passage, it's wonderful. It goes from almost some people believing and then I forget the verse precisely, but in the middle of that passage I just read, and then it says, many people believed. Now we were praying to the God who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Now we've seen some fruitfulness, but let's contend and let's believe uh, for more. God wants to save. Uh, losing my thread a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> what's my point? Uh, Paul's not a loner. He's not just trying to work his, his faith out in private. And some encouragement doesn't just come in private. It comes in connection. It comes in relationship. Paul, if you like, is this massive gift, but he is in and needs relationships with other people. We see that with Aquila and Priscilla. And they are quite significant. We, we see that Silas and Timothy... Uh, kind of catch up with him. They, they come to town as well. And we could just think of them as colleagues, but they're so much more than that. They are, they're friends on a mission together. And that's just so important. It's so important that we don't get obsessed or distracted by what's someone's title? What's, what's someone's position? Have they been given a particular role or not? And you know, we can think of church, but I hasten to add, I don't want us to think of church in this way. We can think of it as this pyramid and almost like a series of line management and, 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 a, and a set of kind of, just an organization, just any other organization that's out there. It's not. And there are things about God's people, the church, that can never and never should be just try, written down on some organizational flow chart. It's about relationship. It's about knowing and being known. It's about being brothers and sisters, not having some, some badge or medal or stripes on the shoulder, a rank, a position, a title. It's about being God's people together. And so we, we don't have to exactly try and chart out. 
What, what was the organization like? Paul's a man who knew, who knew that he needed to be in relationship. And God put people alongside him um, and put him alongside other people to see the kingdom of God extend. And that, that brought fresh fellowship. Maybe there was some fresh courage for him in that. One wonders, why did the arrival of Silas and Timothy help him kind of change gear a little bit? Because it says before that, he's been tent making, he's been working during the week, and perhaps on the Sabbath would go to the, the temple, uh, sorry, go to the synagogue and try and persuade people that Jesus is the Messiah. So kind of working hard, nine to five, maybe longer, and then gets to the Sabbath and then shares. He goes from that, uh, Silas and Timothy rock up, and that's like the cue to turn up the dial and do more. That could be around just relationship. He's strengthened by having these brothers with him. Could also be, maybe Luke is being a bit British at this point, and he's like not talking about the money. But it could be that actually Silas and Timothy have turned up with fresh financial support. So you don't have to tent make for now. Let's just focus on, on ministry, if you like. That, that could be what's going on. But either which way, it's like a, 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 things get turned up. Which reminds me of, whether it's a month ago, I can't quite remember, when we last filled the baptistry and we th what we think happened is the thermostat broke. And you know what a thermostat does, it kind of keeps a limit on the temperature. So it heats up by a certain amount, but if it reaches a nice temperature, then it just maintains that temperature. And sometimes we can think of church life or the Christian life in those terms. We're just, we're just basically here to maintain. Now I know we shouldn't baptise people in water that's close to boiling, that wouldn't be good. But let me just use it as a positive illustration for the moment. We can just get used to things as they are. Just keep a limit. Keep a check on things. Don't get too carried away. And maybe the Lord might just prophetically say to us, no, actually, I want to take that limit away. I want to, it's time for the temperature to rise. Maybe it's time for us to believe and go again for more. Rather than just think that our job as a believer and as a church is just to maintain and live by a kind of memory, a recollection of the sorts of things that have happened before and we'll kind of, we'll just do like rinse and repeat. Things are basically just chugging along and perhaps there are ways and times where God just gets the attention of his people and says, no, 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 that, that's, not what I, that's not what I'm saying, that's not what I'm doing. God can get our attention with even a baptistry that doesn't behave itself very well all the time. And relationship is so, um, so important that actually in seeking God and what he wants to do, we're involved together, not just isolated, not just going it alone. Well, you might say, but yeah, surely you know, the mission itself is not all about being friendly and having the finance we need, those are just tools. That's not like the be all and end all. The, the ultimate goal is not just make a community where people get on and make a community where there's kind of a, a nice niceness in our generosity. Now, that's not the goal, is it? Just to have like the holy club, the little club we are brothers and sisters, we're in a relationship, but that's for purpose. It's not let's just be friends, it's let's be friends on a mission together. So what as friends, as we love and support each other, what's the next stage of God's mission that he has us be on? There's more to it than just having a friendly vibe. So what else strengthens Paul? Well, I think he's strengthened, I guess, in just seeing not just fresh fellowship, but Fresh fruitfulness. Actually, the fruit doesn't come straight away. Uh, we hear more about that conflict again. He, he goes to the synagogue. He's trying to persuade people that Jesus is the Messiah. And then it starts up again, the abuse. People start to treat Paul, actually, as many of the religious leaders of the day treated Jesus. They, they reviled him. They slandered him. They, they spoke 
ill of him. If you're really God, you'd come down from that cross, save yourself. Just got mocked, even spat upon. And Paul is starting to get that reaction. And you wonder at that point, did his heart sink? Or was there strangely some encouragement in that? Like what's better? To get no reaction at all? Or to sometimes get a bad reaction? And I wonder if we want to see more people come to Christ and have this kind of good reaction, I just know I need to come to God. I know I need to get right with him. I want to give my life to him. I'm going to do this weird thing with my, all my clothes on and everyone watching and clapping. I'm getting into a pool of water, which is hopefully about 37 degrees, and it's go, I'm going to go down and I'm going to come up. If we want to see more of those kind of reactions, I know God is on my case. Nothing else in life is quite satisfying but I keep reading about and hearing about Jesus and there is no one else like him. And I'm hearing that he's, he wasn't just some martyr who died, he actually rose again. So the reality of this person called Jesus is that I can speak to him right now and know him and hear him. I get to know what life is to be like in the pages of his word I get to learn about following him, and I can know him. I can actually be filled. This person wants to come and fill me by his Holy Spirit and enable me to live a new life. To get those good responses, maybe we need to encounter some bad responses as well. What? This Jesus that you keep talking about? Nothing but trouble. And you're an idiot for believing in him. Maybe we've got to hear a little bit of that if we're going to hear a little bit of, of the other. It says, Paul says when he writes to the, this Corinthian church later on, he says, I resolved, when I was with you, I resolved to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Paul, he perseveres and he stays fresh in God. I think because that is his kind of relentless focus. Really, nothing else matters in comparison to Christ and him crucified. God, as man, dying on the cross, that is the place where we encounter life. That place that appeared to be utter horror and defeat is the ultimate victory that leads us into new life. So again, verse 4, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogues trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. What is he trying to persuade them of? Well, later on we find in the next verse, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. He's the only one who can save He's the only one who can forgive. He's the only one who can bring us into new life. He is the only one who can ready us for an eternity of delight with God. And what keeps Paul fresh, maybe, is that he's actually seeing people come to faith. He leaves the synagogue, goes next door to some guy's house with a strange name, and even the guy, one of the synagogue leaders, Crispus, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. You, it's, I think it's impossible to get weary of this, what we've seen this morning. It's impossible, I think it's impossible to be jaded or cynical about just the joy of someone being baptized I was at the, uh, the pastoral event that, that Ginny was leading yesterday, just as an aside. And at the end of the day, if, I hope you don't mind me mentioning Karis, but Karis is there with Margot, just on her lap. And she, you know, she's been fed, she's been looked after the whole way through. And then just at the end, as I sat behind, I just saw this beautiful little girl just beaming at her mum. Like, you, you can't get tired of that, can you? Just the, the wonder of new life and I'm sure there's loads of challenges and sleepless nights and a bit of mess 
but the sheer joy of, of seeing new life and relate in that way. That, that is the joy that we have in, in coming to God ourselves and being born again. And that's the joy that we have when we see others. So, so Adam, it's absolutely true what Rachel or possibly someone else said, that hundreds of people are profoundly encouraged by your example today and what God has done in your life, what God is doing in your life today and what God will do in your life uh, in the future as well. You, you, you can't get tired of seeing people get baptised. It's a wonderful privilege and, and it's new life. And I'm sure in Corinth, it got messy. There'd be leaders having sleepless nights or staying up light, late to write lengthy letters. Like I think the longer the letters, probably the bigger the mess in the church. So like Corinth, like at least two massive letters. Gently, sometimes not so gently, kind of correcting them on all manner of things. But you know what? Paul still says, I can't stop giving thanks for the faithfulness of God and the work of God. We'd rather have the mess and the new life than not have the mess and not have any new life. And staying fresh in that, and, and Paul can say about them some, uh, some helpful things for us to kind of remember. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, writing to this church, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He didn't rock up in this cosmopolitan city and then just discover all the most talented and awesome people wanted to gather to be part of this new thing. If anything, it was the other way around. Uh, we'll say that, say in, in chapter 6 of the same letter. I think it's chapter 6. He says um, in verse 9, Or do you not know that, that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That sounds quite hard, doesn't it? But listen to the next verse. And that's what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's a powerful gospel that God wants to change our lives. God wants us to be ready and fit for his kingdom. The gospel is the power of God that actually brings life and it brings change. And to see that and to experience that being worked out in our lives is just tremendously encouraging. Let's believe for fresh fruitfulness. We might have actually organized it for today, but we don't like to plan too much, at least I don't. Before long, like pester the elders, when do we get to pray and fast together as a church? When can we next pray and fast? Because we want to pray for this fresh fruitfulness. Let's pray that God would turn some believed into many believed, and we'll enjoy whatever comes as a result. But I think something else is going on for Paul in Corinth. In some respects, we can say, look, glorious, the same gospel is having the same powerful effect on people's lives in yet another place that he's visited. But there is something else that's going on in him. Even though there would be loads of positive things that he could focus on, I wonder if in here he is focused on some of the hardships and some of the struggles, and maybe even personally, He's just tempted to dial things down a bit. What do I mean? I think he's facing fear. 
That's the battle in his mind. I think that can be the battle for us as well. Because it's possible to say, I, I know that there are some really positive and encouraging things happening. And I do know that. But sometimes it's easier, obviously, to think about the really, really negative things. They're kind of there, but they're almost like it's just a bit detached. It's a bit theory. Actually, where we're, in our minds where we are is somewhere else. And that can be faith, that uh, can be fear rather than faith. And on a human level, there are, there are good reasons for Paul to be scared. Again, when he writes to the Corinthians, he can say, when I was with you, I, I, didn't, I came in fear and trembling. I didn't come with eloquence and wise and persuasive words. I, the way in which I spoke was a demonstration of the Spirit's power because it clearly wasn't a demonstration of a person's power. I came in fear. I came trembling. I came weak. And why was that? Well, we looked at it before. Again, uh, writing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. You can write to Timothy and say, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. And you can read back through Acts and you can see what happened. Go to a place. Share the gospel, get a bad reaction from some people, starts to receive abuse. What happens next? They start to make plots as to how to ill-treat him. He moves on quickly, but they follow. He moves on quickly, but they follow. He's kind of being chased down. He's being hunted. And then in one place, that rises to kind of a crescendo where they do actually get him. And at one point, Paul then is surrounded by people who are picking up stones and are throwing them at him. They're trying to kill him. They're trying to take him out. God's done amazing things, but that's in his experience now. He has gone through a significant trauma. How easy it would be for him to think, I wonder... If the same thing is going to happen again, the abuse has started. How long is it going to be before they start to plot? How long is it going to be before they start to chase? How long is it going to be before they start to stone me? I can see God's doing some great stuff, but I think I'm just going to move on quickly. It's time for a change. I don't want to go through that again. I can't go through that again. And it's easy for that question, I wonder if it happens again. To become, I bet it happens again. And it's easy for, I bet it will happen again, to become, I know it will happen again. And you know what? In God, you don't know that. And in God, don't place that bet. What keeps God, what keeps Paul on track at this time, as well as the other stuff, is God graciously comes to him in a vision. I think if God hadn't come to him in that way, he could have kept going. But maybe his way of just keeping going would be, I'll just, I'll do the same thing, rinse and repeat. I'm not looking to get overly involved. I'll quickly be on my way. But he does, he starts to do something different in Corinth. 
because God comes to him. What refreshes him? How does he run well in the purposes of God? By knowing fresh encounter with God. Where God comes to him. Verse 9, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. I can just sense it's, it's, going, it's about to happen. The same thing's going to happen again. No. God says, no one's going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. Oh, let's pray for that many people. But maybe the many people, it's not just many people are going to get saved. Hallelujah. Yes, they are. But many people are going to be with you. Many people are going to be for you. There'll be people who are going to protect you. God is completely sovereign over our lives. And if you have experienced something utterly traumatic, it's completely understandable that you may think and you may feel, is the same thing going to happen again? Let God be God. Paul receives fresh grace. It's not like there's never any difficulty again. There's never any challenge yet again. But if he's asking God the, the question, is the same thing going to happen? The answer is no. And the story ends with Sosthenes getting beaten up. I don't know if Sosthenes is like a believer or like the synagogue ruler who didn't handle the case very well. We can't say that nothing nasty is ever going to happen again. But we can know God speaking and cutting through. This could be the moment for you right now through the preaching of, your, for the, preaching of the word. You get the still small voice of God saying, I am with you. Keep going, not just being friendly, but keep going on the mission of God because I'm with you. Keep building the church because I'm with you. Keep sharing your faith because I'm with you. Keep believing for things that you've yet never experienced in life because I'm with you. Don't just turn the dial down. Don't just think, oh, well, just mark time. Don't just think, well, I don't mind doing the things that I've done before, but there's no way I'm stepping out in something fresh. Because God's with you might be in this moment right now God is just what is speaking that into your situation it's funny isn't it sometimes to encourage each other like it's a natural and a usual phrase in this country now is to say you've got this I think it's nice isn't it? it kind of fits in with that kind of believe in yourself rubbish okay and there's an element to which it's nice to hear you think, oh this person thinks I've got it. Little do they know. I don't. <laughs> no. We don't encourage each other with you've got this. We encourage each other with God has got you. And God has got us. Therefore we find hope. Therefore we find courage. Therefore we, uh, we go again. Therefore we don't just quickly move on. Therefore, we don't just shrink back from relationship. Therefore, we don't just live life according to what we've experienced so far, but by faith. It might be in this moment. It might be at another moment. Just one last story before we, um, before we worship again in just a moment. Um, uh, Rachel and I went through a, a phase where people tried to burgle us a lot. Actually, it happened quite early on in church life. Someone nearby must have worked out when the prayer meeting was, but we weren't typically at home on that particular evening, so they chose that moment to break in. That's going back years. Other occasions were kind of like woken up to someone kind of trying to bust a tank through the garage and suddenly kind of startled awake. And, and then there was the time uh, awake in the very early hours of the morning, just 
hearing something, looking out the window and seeing a guy with a, with a motorcycle helmet on, just walking up the drive, looking at the house. And uh, we turn, turn the lights on and at that point, kind of, he pretended, or maybe she, but I think it was a he, pretended just to kind of like aimlessly be looking around and then kind of like wandered off again. Um, I would love to be able to say it was through my godly counsel or, or preaching that the fear lifted. But Rach went for a walk. I mean, we both affected us both, but Rach went for a walk and she saw some trees. She saw the sky. Maybe she heard some birds. She looked at this big, vast body of water and then just heard God say, no one's chasing you. And that was God coming with a whisper, refreshing and restoring. So you've got to look out for those moments as well and believe God for them. And then use them and say, let's go again. Let's go again for the mission of God. We're not just here to be nice friends. We are that. We're here to believe that God wants to save many people. Let's pray soon and let's pray now.